instead of going to Stacy's wedding, now we're going to Stacy's memorial. She's buried in her wedding dress. She was really excited about getting married. She really loved Jimmy. She told me that she wasn't very excited to get married because she was sleeping with a black guy named Rodney. Wow, you need to be careful with this. They found that Rodney Reed's DNA is identical to the DNA recovered from Stacy Stites' body. It must be a char or something. If Rodney Reed did have a relationship with Stacy Stites, doesn't that complicate your case? He was a black male having sex with a white girl. I knew my son had been railroaded. I got to fight these people to save my son's life. Bastrop, it's a typical small Texas town on the Colorado. It's a town that represents a wide swath of what Texas is all about. Certainly the churches, football on Friday nights. All Bears, Bastrop led 76 to nine. That is not a typo, folks. I grew up here. Uh, my dad grew up here, my grandparents grew up here. Louisiana has a town named after the same guy that's called Bastrop, but we say Bastrop. I'm a fifth generation Bastropian. Bastrop is known as the home of the Lost Pines. It's an old, old town and there's a lot of history. Bastrop was founded by immigrants from the southern United States. They brought enslaved African Americans with them. In the days of segregation, we as African Americans provided jobs for one another. We had our own barber shops, restaurants. The class of 1970 was the first fully integrated class in Bastrop High School. In the mid-90s, even at that period of time, the African Americans and the whites were, I think, separated in a lot of ways. Interracial dating in Bastrop in the 90s existed, but it was something that was hidden and it was dangerous. We've come a long way in some instances, but yet and still, justice is slow in Bastrop County for African Americans. This morning, 19-year-old Stacy Lee Stites was reported missing. Family members came from all corners of Texas to comfort Carol Stites. She lost her youngest, Stacy Lee. She had her plans, and now somebody's taken that away. I think you just about got it. Where am I? You're in the far end there. Yeah. Grab your tickle. There you go. Yep. It's been 24 years yes. since you lost your daughter, Stacy. Yep. Tell me a little bit about Stacy. Stacy was your youngest of five. I found out that I was uh, pregnant with Stacy, and I had cancer at the same time. And so I put off any drugs or any chemicals to keep that child alive until I had her. Because that soul was more precious to me than mine. From the time she was able to move, she was up and at them. She was like the white tornado. That's exactly what they called her when she, she was, was little. Everything. She was into everything and did everything and friends with everybody. I was friends with Stacy in high school. We were involved in some church groups and sports together. She was just kind of like a sunflower, sunshine. She um, was funny. She was always cracking jokes. She didn't really take a lot of things seriously. She was always in the moment. She was looking for what everybody does, young love. Go away. 
Stacy lost her father as a child, and apparently it had quite an impact on her. According to friends and family, she seemed to lose her way for a while. She ended up pregnant. She was 15. Mm -hmm. Yes, devastating. It took two of my daughters to get me in a room upstairs by myself to let me know what had gone on. She did decide to give the baby up for adoption. Every year, Smithville has their jamboree. That's where I'm Stacy met Jimmy Fennell. He was on duty at the festival, you know, security. And they got to talking, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked. Pretty soon, he was hanging around the house, and they talked and talked. <laughs> what did you think of him? I like Jimmy. He was raised in the church that I was raised in. He's had the same values that I was raised with. I thought he was heaven sent. This guy was here, and it was just about everything that I wanted in a son-in-law. She was more outgoing. He was a little more conservative, but I thought he was good for her. That's the picture of her and him. That was at his graduation when he became a policeman. Jimmy began working for the Giddings Police Department. Stacy was very excited about their relationship. Stacy moved in with Jimmy in his apartment upstairs, and Carol lived in the same building downstairs caddy corner to Stacy and Jimmy's apartment. They moved in together and they said, we're engaged, we're getting married. <laughs> so <laughs> that was just about, the, I, okay, you're, at least you're getting married. You're not going to live in sin, as I would think of it. It was going to be a big wedding. She was so excited. She had planned every detail. Here's the thing for the Georgetown Church of Christ, the yeah. fees and the use of the church facilities. Yeah. <laughs> she was wanting to make more money for her wedding. She went into HEB's grocery company, and they gave her a job in the produce department. And so Stacy had to be at work early in the morning. She was working hard. Every two weeks when she got paid, she was making a payment on the wedding dress. Yes. There was excitement in the beginning, but I think as every day kind of ticked by, it was less and less. I know that it was definitely stressful for her just because she had to work and come home and she was expected to do laundry, clean. For a 19 year old, that's kind of a big transition. Does she share any concerns? She didn't share any concerns that she was really excited about getting married. She really loved Jimmy. You were a little concerned, you were a little emotional before the wedding. Um, Stress. And that you cried a couple of times. You thought that Jimmy wasn't quite as... I was the mother, and Stacy was my daughter, and I expected him to perform the way I wanted him to. My name is Athena, and... We were besties, um, high school. This is going back in time. Oh, wow. Stacy called me and told me that she's getting engaged and getting married. And Stacy never sounded like a giddy girl in love. She sounded, she sounded giddy about her wedding and planning her wedding and making things for her wedding. But I didn't, she never talked about Jimmy. I think that she started seeing sides of Jimmy that he was very possessive and it was kind of his way or no way. And I don't know that she was necessarily comfortable with that, so I think that they started butting heads. Tell me, Carol, when you got the call. The HEBs called. It said that Stacy hadn't got to work. That's the first inkling that something is wrong. We didn't know what to do. We made flyers and started walking door to door, hoping that we could find her alive.
tell me about that night before April 22nd. Do you remember that night? It was normal, everyday evening stuff. The voice that I've heard all my year, and it makes me sound a little nuts, and I call it the Holy Spirit all my life that I've had guide me. It said, you did a good job, and now your job is done. How do you tell your daughter that the thoughts in your mind was, if you was to die today, I can never be more proud of you? How do you tell that to a, a, someone? We know that Jimmy Finnell was at Little League practice from around 5 in the evening on April 22, 1996. At around 8 o'clock p.m., Carol saw Jimmy come home from Little League practice. Carol actually saw Jimmy and Stacy meet outside and have sort of an embrace outside her window. Of course, she lives downstairs. And she saw Stacy walking with Jimmy, laughing and joking as they went up the stairs to their apartment. The last words out of her mouth is, Mom, I love you. And I said, I know you do. The narrative that Jimmy provides is that the two of them are basically home for a good part of the evening, and they're sort of getting along great. And that then she goes to bed, he stays up and watches some TV. We knew from Jimmy, her fiance, Stacy Seitz left her home at approximately 3 a.m. like she always did to go to a 3.30 a.m. shift at the HEB to work in produce. She drove Jimmy's truck. Um, as she often did, her normal route to work was on Highway 21 through Bastrop. Andrew Cardenas is a co-worker of hers, and he's there in the parking lot waiting for Stacy to arrive. Stacy never does. And Stacy's not one to be late for work. And that's the first inkling that something is wrong. They found a red truck in Bastrop by the high school. At about 5.23 that morning, a patrol officer had come across it. He didn't know that it had any relevance to anything. He called it into dispatch just because it was at the high school. It didn't register as stolen. He was advised that the truck was owned by Fennell. He basically was able to look inside the truck. It was securely locked. The ignition was intact. There was nothing overtly wrong that he knew about. And so he just went on his way and continued his patrol. Then as darkness shifts to daybreak, that innocent looking truck becomes a little more suspicious. Roughly an hour later, around about 6.45 in the morning, Carol Stites gets a phone call from the grocery store wondering where Stacy is. She hasn't shown up. Stacy was always on time. Did you suspect something was wrong immediately? No, I thought maybe his truck broke down or something. I immediately turned around and called Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, Stacy didn't make it to HEBs. And he says, OK, I'll be down in just a minute. He's getting dressed. He's tucking in his shirt. She notices that he looks like he's just woke up. She grabbed the keys. She handed them to Jimmy so that he could go look for Stacy. My name is David Board. I worked as a detective for the Bastrop Police Department at the time of Stacy Stites' disappearance. I received a call of a missing person. Stacy Stites had left Giddings, Texas and was en route to work at HEB and Bastrop and never made it. When the call comes in that Stacy didn't make it to work, then dispatch and the patrol officer had sort of a uh-oh moment and they went back. Her pickup truck was at the Bastrop High School. So I responded there. I remember there was a belt, a part of a leather belt was located outside the truck. Now we've got a missing person, and we've got the car that she was supposedly driving that morning. So we're going to put these together. They impound the truck. Once Jimmy Finnell, Stacy's fiance, unlocks that truck for investigators, they ask him to take a look and point out anything that seems unusual. Detective Ed Sommel of the Bastrop Police Department stated that Jimmy pointed out a piece of green-colored plastic. 
Jimmy stated that it was part of a glass that Stacy drank out of and that it was not in the truck broken like that before. Jimmy then pointed out one of the tennis shoes that was lying on the passenger floorboard. Jimmy pointed out that one of Stacy's earrings was on the passenger side floorboard. There were body floats in the floorboard of that truck. Didn't really know exactly what it was or what caused it, but it was, it was unusual. There was evidence of a struggle at the truck. We suspected foul play. The police chief questions Jimmy and says that he's visibly shaken and very concerned, but not in a state of panic. Then Jimmy identifies that belt found outside the truck as Stacy's, and that's when he breaks down. Then he goes home to be with Stacy's mom, Carol, to wait. Since her truck was found, she was nowhere around. The Texas Ranger, Rocky Wardlow, was contacted. We went up in the helicopter, searched all over Bastrop. What was going through your mind, Crystal, all day? Hoping that we could find her alive, but still have dread. Stacy's body isn't discovered until about 3.30 that afternoon, alongside of a dirt road kind of out in the county. There was a fellow who was out there for an appointment, and he had stopped to pick his wife wildflowers because it was the spring in Texas, and then he found her body. It had to be devastating. What? It, it was awful. It, it was, was awful. awful. And then, as unbelievable as it may sound in this small town, just two weeks after Stacy's body is discovered, a second young woman is found dead in the woods. The citizens of Bastrop were believing they may have a serial killer on the loose. They found Stacy on the side of a road and a bunch of wildflowers. It had to be devastating. It was. She, it, it was awful. It, it was, was awful. awful. My memory of that is, uh, is my mom just sitting in her chair, just my baby, my baby, yeah, yeah, my baby, so. my baby. We had a bridal shower just a couple of days before she died. And all the bridal stuff was still sitting on my dining room table. How did you even process that? The pastor from the church is the one who told me. and. Um, my question to him was, how could God let this happen? Things, things happen, you know, this, this is the devil's world. When the DPS crime lab arrives, this is an impressive vehicle that comes down this dirt road in the middle of a pine forest. Exiting were photographers, serologists, physical evidence collection people. This was quite a unique crew to show up in this little sleepy county of Bastrop. Stacy's body is kind of almost a 10 to 12 feet off of the road in the high grass. She's laying on her back, and in between her legs, there's her name tag for the AGB. And she is missing a shoe from the foot that we found the shoe in the truck. That seems to be the shoe that she's missing. The interesting thing about that is her sock that's revealed underneath is completely clean, so it doesn't look like Stacy walked to this location. It looks like she was carried to this location and placed, meaning dumping a body. The way she was clothed, what she'd been doing, how her zipper was broken from being pulled apart, about all of the things that told us this was a classic rape case. There was what appeared to be the mate of that black woven belt that was found in the high school parking lot laying on the side of the road. So this scene is now tying to the high school parking lot. It was a braided leather belt uh, that had been busted. It would appear to me that it was leather and that for it to, to break, it would have had to have a tremendous amount of force pulling on it. It was enough force on that belt around Stacy Stites' neck to kill her. 
Stacy Stites was strangled to death. The only prints that they were able to lift from the inside of the truck that were readable prints were Stacy's and Jimmy's. And yet, since that was his truck, his fingerprint being in that truck is not evidence of him perpetrating the crime. Jimmy Fennell was absolutely considered as a suspect. Any time a woman is murdered, the significant other is and should be one of the prime suspects. Around the time of Stacy's death, another woman by the name of Mary Ann Alt was also found dead. A man named David Lawhon had confessed to her killing, and there was some talk that he might have been responsible for Stacy's death. We knew about that case, and um, I know that it was definitely a, a, consideration. a consideration that there might have been um, a serial murderer up there. There are some similarities between the Stacy Stites case and the Mary Ann case. Mary Ann Alt is a little bit older than Stacy Stites, but in both a truck is used, and in both a body is dumped, and in both a earring is an important piece of evidence. David Lawhon had bragged about killing Stacy, and so David Lawhon became a suspect in Stacy Stites' murder. However, David Lawhon was excluded pretty quickly because the DNA from Stacy's murder did not match. David Lawhon is convicted of that second murder, but still no arrests in Stacy's case, and her devastated family is mourning her loss. Stacy's funeral was there in Bastrop. It was standing room only. The police set up a camera, a secret camera, to provide surveillance of the ceremony that's taking place. They are trying to surreptitiously capture people's emotions, people's reactions. I remember walking around and thinking, did the person that killed Stacy, did they come to her funeral? There are very few murders in Bastrop a sleepy little southeast Texas town. Broken and this one to be a young girl who went to high school, played sports, was active in her church. This would be the last person most people would believe would be involved in a crime. There are 32 H-E-B employees from Austin helping out at this Bastrop store, a small favor they feel for fellow workers trying to cope with a traumatic experience. Very sad for what happened. Almost all of the more than 100 workers from this store are attending the memorial service for Stacy Stites. At the church, at the funeral, the police place two camcorders in strategic locations. The camcorder that is placed in a box with a hole cut in the box, it's placed like that so that you can't tell that it's a video recording device. Four days after this crime, they don't have any direct leads on anybody. And so they're looking for anything that seems out of the ordinary, anything that looks like it might point to a suspect. We were supposed to be getting together for a wedding in a few weeks. Instead of going to Stacy's wedding, now we're going to Stacy's memorial. It was devastating to all of us, including Jimmy. He was definitely a man who had just lost his fiance. Jimmy went over to the coffin and he had the wedding ring in his hand and he put the wedding ring on her finger. Told her goodbye. Yeah, told her goodbye. It was devastating. And she's buried with that wedding ring. She's buried in her wedding dress. And uh, she worked hard for that wedding dress. And we all decided that that's what she should be buried in. There was a graveside service. And what seemed unusual to me at that service was just that Jimmy, 
her fiance really didn't show a lot of emotion at all. Of course, everybody grieves in their own way. Now today, Stacy's mother and sisters say they have always believed that Jimmy was innocent. But at the time, Stacy's sister Crystal was so concerned about Jimmy's behavior that she hired a private investigator and even made a list of his questionable behavior. You kind of want to suspect the people nearest to her and then you try to figure it out in your head of what happened and how did it happen. And But once we knew that she had been raped, it, we, our emotions were like, it had to be somebody else. We did not believe that Jimmy had hurt Stacy at all. In fact, Jimmy himself even later talked about the pain he was feeling over Stacy's death. It's going to be with me forever. I'll think about it. It'll be there. There's no way it's going to go away. So Karen Blakely was the lead DNA analyst who processed the crime scene. She makes a telephone call to Rocky Wardlow, the lead investigator on the case. Karen Blakely told him the semen was deposited at the same time as the death. Essentially, she told him the rape happened at the same time Stacy died. It meant that Rocky Wardlow had the smoking gun. It meant that all he needed to do was to find the depositor of the semen. He is simply looking for a DNA match. Investigators obtained reference samples from 28 men who had some part in Stacy Stites life, acquaintances, friends, co-workers. Not one of them is a match, not even her fiance, Jimmy Fennell. So the police were wondering, is there some other explanation? What if Stacy had been cheating? Could that be a motive for Jimmy Fennell to kill her? It was hard being having the finger pointed at you. It was hard for them saying that, yeah, you killed Stacy, your fiance, that you did it because of these reasons, these reasons, you know. But, you know, I kept in my mind that I didn't do it. County Sheriff's Office. There's a recorded phone conversation in which a woman calls in anonymously and claims her son was having an affair with Stacy. I think Stacy was having a liaison. Okay, I'm almost positive of it. I mean, we've all kind of assumed that. Who has a, a motive for this? Well, at this point, the boyfriend does. That's right. That's a prime suspect. The person that we're trying to find is a liaison. For the longest time, we've had our suspicions. Okay. The woman refuses to provide her son's name, although subsequently he was identified and he was ruled out. And as the call continues, you can hear the investigator's frustration. It's been four months and this investigation is going nowhere. See, at this point, we're stymied. We've, we've hit a brick wall. Huh? I have to look at Stacy Stats' mom at least once a week, every day, in the face. And it makes me not want to answer the phone because I know it's her. And I know she, she's got, she wants me to tell her something, and I have nothing That's to tell you. her. We can see that Rocky Wardlow continues to look at Jimmy Fennell through 1996 as, a, as his investigation continues to go on. We can see that because he gives him a polygraph test. One of the questions asked Jimmy was, did you strangle Stacy? Jimmy answered he did not. Another question asked Jimmy was, were you involved in the death? of Stacy Stites. Jimmy Fennell stated again, he was not. The examiner determined that Jimmy was deceptive in these two answers. Jimmy, in defense of himself, said that he was emotional, that all he could visualize in his mind was her lying deceased in the casket. So it didn't concern you at all that he seemed to be deceptive on the polygraph test? No. Nah, I think we would talk about it and think that he was just upset. I think he felt bad that he didn't get up and take her to work that day. And, so, then, and then you feel like, if I had been there, this wouldn't have happened. Right. What was it that led them to eliminate Jimmy Fennell? Because of the logistic problems. Jimmy's truck was found in Bastrop. 
And he was home in Giddings, which is some 30 miles away. And so that was the problem, is that law enforcement could never make it make any sense that Jimmy had any involvement in this because they couldn't figure out how he ever could have gotten back home. Unless he had a friend who might have given him a ride. The investigators, the Texas Rangers, explored the possibility that somehow maybe someone had helped him and they could never find anything or anybody that credibly could have helped him. They looked at the mileage on the different patrol vehicles there at Giddings PD where he worked to see if there was any of those that were off and there weren't. They looked at whether there were bus fares for, for people that night and there weren't any. They looked at cab fares to see if there was some way he could have taken a cab. Jimmy Vanell himself has always insisted that he is innocent. They thoroughly vetted all the evidence they had and they cleared him. It was only after they matched the DNA to somebody that they dropped Jimmy as a suspect. Another woman is violently attacked, and this woman lives, and her case is about to change everything. I'm one of the investigators on the uh, Stacey Stein's murder. Do you even know who she is? Stacy's murder goes unsolved for nearly a year. The cops are ostensibly looking at Jimmy and maybe in a couple other directions, but nothing's really happening. 1996 was an election year. Richard Hernandez won the position of the Bastrop County Sheriff. Hernandez announced that he would solve the murder of Stacy Stites within six months of taking office. Richard Hernandez seizes on the Stites case and this investigation begins to speed up. Wardlow is looking for a DNA match. That's the smoking gun. Linda Schluter was another woman who was about 19 who had been abducted and beaten. Linda Schluter was at this payphone, Bastrop, and there's a man who's kind of bothering her. And he picked up the payphone next to the payphone I was on. He proceeded to ask me if he could get a ride. And he said, I'm going to freeze to death. I felt bad. So I said, fine, I'll give you a ride. Once we took a ride on Main Street, he started to get out. And he got back in really quick. And he said, don't I get a hug? And the next thing I know, he grabs me by the back of my hair with his left hand and proceeds to slam my face into my steering wheel. There's an incredible fight happening in the car. She basically gets away, and this guy uh, takes her car and drives and then sort of crash abandons it somewhere down the road. Deputies arrived, took her into Bastrop. They photographed her injuries. They took a statement. I described the man that I gave a ride to. The police automatically knew who he was. They presented six African-Americans on a piece of paper. This is the one who attacked me. The police told me that his name was Rodney Reed. Mr. Reed was arrested, and later he was released without posting a bond. He was just released. The way in which Linda Schluter was attacked really lent itself to the police narrative of how Stacey Stice was attacked. Rodney Reed surfaced as a suspect wholly and exclusively because he tried to abduct Linda six months after Stacy's murder. And a detective told the ranger about the case, and the ranger said, oh my god, that sounds like the Stites case. Rocky Wardlow, the lead investigator from the Texas Rangers, he's wondering, do we have Rodney Reed's DNA on file? And it turns out they did have a sample of Rodney Reed's DNA in the system. Because he had been involved with a woman in 1995 in some sort of a relationship. And she alleged that Rodney Reed had sexually assaulted her in her apartment. I responded and conducted a crime scene investigation. She ultimately declines to pursue charges against Reed, and that case is kind of dropped, but the police retain this biological evidence. Texas Ranger Rocky Wardlow, 
He requested that the serologist take the DNA off a washcloth and various other items collected in October 1995 and compare it to the DNA collected off Stacy Stites' body. It was a match. They found that Rodney Reed's DNA is identical to the DNA evidence recovered from Stacy's body. My name is Sandra Reed, and I am Rodney Reed's mother. Richard Hernandez, the sheriff, and the city police came to the house, and I knew Richard before he even became sheriff and they were looking for Rodney. Rodney was not there. So I said, Richard, I said, what is this for? Well, me, I'm thinking, it's drugs. Well, look, Richard, I said, now, people know Rodney don't sell drugs. He's not a drug dealer. He said, I know, Sandra, he said, but uh, that's what they got. So sure enough, Rodney came home. And I said, well, buddy, and get you some warm clothes, cause I'm taking you to jail. So they basically get Ronnie into the police station on a drug related charge, but it all seems pretty um, much kind of a ruse in order to ask him about Stacy. I don't sell no drugs. Uh -huh. So what are we talking about? Well, uh, let me read you Ryan some stuff first. Uh... Rodney, and then we'll, we'll get off into that. <clears throat> oh, so we're talking about dipping in with... Yeah, that drug case, I just want to kind of push it off to the sides. Of course, you, you know that I'm one of the investigators on the uh, Stacey and Stein's murder. You're one of the many, many people that we have, have talked to regarding this case. Talking about you was really nothing unusual. What I want to know from you is if you know this girl, and if you do, when did you meet her? Have you ever met her? Or do you even know who she is? No, I do not. I don't know what Stacy said. I've seen that, that, that stuff on the news and stuff like that, but I don't, I don't know that person. Never dated her? No, I haven't. What I would like to get from you, if, if you don't mind, is a written statement stating that I don't know the Stacy Stein. Do you have a problem with that? No, I don't. And along with the statement, what I'd like to do is if it's okay with you, is to get a sample of your blood, uh, get some uh, saliva samples and some tear samples, so that we can compare that with some of the stuff that we that we already have. I don't mind doing the thing, but I'd like to have a lawyer, an attorney, you know, to, to back me up on what I'm doing. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand. That's that's perfectly all right. Okay. No, David, 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 yeah. David. Yeah. All this here, this stuff here, am I being charged with something? What What is it we like about? By the time the questioning is over, Rodney is charged with the murder of Stacy Stites. He stated that he was afraid. He was aware that Stacy was dead, and he was a black male having sex with a white girl in Bastrop. Stacy Stites was white. Rodney Reed was black. Rodney lived in Texas long enough to know what that meant. This case is about to draw big attention to the small town of Bastrop. He has some high-profile names coming to his defense now. And spark what many believe will be a long road to justice. You're sitting here with me and the clock is ticking to put them to death for something that they know that they did not do. I got to fight to save my son's life. How are you telling your daughter, if you die today, I can never be more proud of you? We know for sure, 100% positive, that Rodney Reed murdered my sister. We did not believe that Jimmy, her fiance, had hurt Stacy at all. They cleared him. An insurance lady provided an affidavit saying that Jimmy Fennell says, if you ever cheat on me, I will kill you and no one will ever know about it. What did the state 
completely get wrong as far as you're concerned about her death? Everything. Morning, investigators charge 29 year old Rodney Rodney Reed of Bastrop with capital murder in connection with the death of Stacy Stipe. When it came out that the person arrested for Stacy's death was tied to DNA. The citizens of Bastrop County would believe that they actually caught the killer. Rodney Reed was charged with sexual assault, kidnapping, and murder of Stacy Stites. With those two enhancements of a kidnap and a rape, where it resulted in a death, it became a death penalty case. Rodney Reed, around that time frame, he was in his late 20s. He was fairly well known around town. In April of 96, he is doing some work at a Super S in Bastrop. Rodney's achievements in sports were phenomenal. He really excelled in boxing. He was a contender in the Golden Gloves. But Rodney Reed also was a free spirit. He had some run-ins with the law. He wasn't a choir boy. He had told me, Mom, I'm dating a girl, and she's engaged to a cop. And I had warned him, Rodney, you have too many irons in the fire, and you're going to get burned. He said that they had a relationship, a sensual relationship. There has never been any evidence whatsoever that there was any type of relationship. There's no notes. There's no there's letters. No phone records. No phone records. My son was arrested for the murder of Stacy Stites. I knew it was a lie instantly. I'm hurt to the core. And at the same time, I got to fight these people to save my son's life. I found a lawyer by the name of Jimmy Brown. He was a good lawyer. I went out to meet Rodney. I knew that he initially denied knowing Stacy, and I asked him about that. Rodney stated that he and Stacy were having sex. Stacy would pick him up at various locations, one being the HEB parking lot. It wasn't boyfriend, girlfriend, it was purely sexual. He was aware that she was dead and uh, that he was a black male having sex with a white girl in Bastra. He stated, you know, quite honestly, uh, that he was afraid. I did tell the family, you're going to need resources to get experts. Rodney Reed's family is not wealthy and they're gonna need at least $50,000 to retain an attorney. And very shortly, it becomes very obvious that the Reed family is not going to be able to raise the money. At that time, in January of 1998, the court appointed Calvin Garvey and Lydia Clay Jackson to represent Rodney Reed. The state had almost two years to investigate the case. We only had two months to prepare. We had numerous motions for continuance. The ruling was generally, I'll give you more funds, but never any more time. The trial of State of Texas versus Rodney Rodell Reed. It started May 4th, 1998. This is arguably the largest case that Bastrop had ever seen. Now, this trial has been front page news here in Bastrop. And a lot of the townspeople we discovered have already formed their own conclusion. At that time, a capital murder case in a small town like Bastrop was unusual. There was also the racial component to it, a African-American defendant, a white victim, and that raised the tension around that case in Bastrop. I have six sons. Uh, Rodney is my fourth son. I have faith in God this was too wrong. I have a God and I'm believing in him, and I will hold on to my faith with God that he will bring 
my son home. I turned it over to God because it all works out in the end and God's still in control. She had hopes and dreams and um, he took that all away. In the opening statements, the prosecution made it clear that the DNA was really the heart of their case. The prosecution called the DNA Cinderella's slipper and it only fits one person. This is DNA that was found inside of Stacy Stites that matches Rodney Reed. The defense told the jury that they were going to provide evidence that Rodney Reed and Stacy Stites had a relationship and that would explain the DNA. In front of an all-white jury, Prosecutor Lisa Tanner began her opening arguments and laid out the narrative that the prosecution would go with the entire trial. That morning, Stacy Seitz got up at 3 or so. She left her apartment to go to a 3.30 a.m. shift at the HEB. Her normal route to work was on Highway 21 through Bastrop, where she would go through the railroad tracks going into Bastrop. And Rodney Reed either jumped in her truck or talked his way into her truck, much like what he did with Linda. We believe from there that Rodney Reed raped her and strangled her, and then dumped her body on the road, and then put her truck less than six-tenths of a mile from his home and walked home. Jimmy Fennell testified in the trial. He gave the timetable and the timeline of where they were, how much he loved his fiance, and that he didn't kill her. The state's key witnesses were Megan Clement and Dr. Bayardo. These individuals painted a damning picture for Mr. Reed. Dr. Bayardo took the stand and he opined on Stacy's time of death. And, and this time of death that he put was 3.30 in the morning. And this was devastating to Rodney's team because it put Stacy in Bastrop at the time of her death. It set the foundation for the fatal blow to be delivered. Their most powerful witness in the name of Megan Clements. Megan Clement was a serologist who tested vaginal samples from Stacy and she connected them with the DNA with Rodney Reed. What I was really waiting for was the testimony about this affair that they contended was happening between Rodney and Stacy. They had one witness who said someone matching Stacy's description came to Reed's house, but she got Stacy's name wrong. Other witnesses that we talked with, in large part, feared there would be retribution should they testify uh, on Rodney's behalf. I knew we were in trouble. Prosecutors are about to deal a devastating blow as they pile on evidence that will cripple Reed's case and his overwhelmed defense team. It is a free-for-all. Rodney's defense attorneys were scrambling to try to get their ducks in a row. The trial really seemed like the prosecution show. They had their DNA evidence. They brought out their specialists. The linchpin of the whole case for them was they had Rodney Reed's DNA inside Stacy Stites. The big weakness in the defense's case was after they told the jury they were going to show evidence of this affair, they weren't able to produce witnesses to testify about it. When the prosecution came over to the jury and said, the secret affair between Rodney Reed and Stacy Stites was so secret that Stacy didn't even know it existed. I think that really sold the jury. After less than a day of deliberating, all of the 12 jurors came back unanimously, and they decided that Rodney Reed was guilty of the capital murder of Stacy Stites. It was not an easy decision. It was very hard. It was a lot of pressure. Consider all the facts, and uh, I believe that justice was done. The 12 white jurors, you know, this is something that you expect. Just like I said before, you know, I had built myself up already for 
this verdict that they were going to give. Since the jurors had found Rodney Reed guilty, now they have to determine what his punishment is for the crime of capital murder. And there's essentially a second trial. This second trial is to determine whether or not he is to be sentenced to death or spend his life in prison. During the punishment phase, the prosecution can bring up anything about your background, prior bad acts, accusations, things that haven't even been proved in court to try to convince the jury that you deserve death. The lawyers for the state bring in unadjudicated rape allegations that they say Rodney committed, but was never charged with until after he is going on trial for Stacy's murder. But the defense said they didn't have time to investigate the claims of any of these witnesses. Among the witnesses who testified was Vivian Harbottle, who was raped six months before Stacy's murder in October of 1995 along the railroad tracks in the area. It was dark and I'd been drinking. And when the police wanted to show me a lineup, I said no, because I couldn't identify this person and I didn't want to pick the wrong person. I think it was like six months to a year until they uh, called me in to say that they had matched the DNA to Rodney Reed. I had no idea who Rodney Reed was. One of the other witnesses at the punishment phase was a young woman by the name of Angela Hamby. Angela Hamby was a 12-year-old girl that lived in Bastrop. Sometime in 89, in, in the first week of September 89, she was raped. That case went unsolved for years until the advancement of DNA and the DNA that was collected from Angela Hamby was cross-referenced with Rodney Reed's DNA, and it was a match. You also have the Linda Schluter case, where the states decided that all of these additional cases were committed by Rodney to bolster the notion that he had murdered and raped Stites. When you have witness after witness after witness coming and saying, the man who's seated next to you did these terrible things, taking a toll out of your client who's told you that no, he did not do that. Convicted murderer Rodney Reed is on death row in Huntsville. A judge formally sentenced him today for the murder of 19-year-old Stacy Stites. It's devastating news for one family. They got a captain murder out of the deal, and that's what they wanted. It's so much. It's so much. That's true, too. News of justice and relief for another. I'm really glad that justice was served and that um, the system really does work. When he was sentenced to death, Deborah, did you have any doubt about whether this was the right person? We haven't had any doubt at all. No. We, we know for, for sure that 100% positive that Rodney Reed murdered my sister. I knew my son had been railroaded. For someone to put them to death for something that they know that they did not do. Once a defendant is sentenced to death in a capital murder case, the state will pay for all of his appeals up to his exoneration or execution. If you look at the entire universe of what has come up as evidence since Rodney's been convicted, you get a very disturbing picture. While Reed is appealing his death sentence, some startling claims emerge from a Texas Rangers investigation into Stacy Stites' former fiance, Officer Jimmy Fennell. I got raped by a car. I need you to call. Are you there with him? Rodney Reed has spent all this time on death row fighting for his life. But what's going on with Jimmy Fennell? Well, he's moved on to another police department up in Georgetown. It's north of Austin. 
In 2007, about 10 years after Stacey Stites' murder, it appears that her former fiance, Officer Jimmy Finnell, is under investigation by the Texas Rangers after a pretty disturbing incident. My name is Connie Lear, and Jimmy Finnell was the police officer who had taken me and raped me. October of 2007, Connie Lear is with her boyfriend at an apartment complex. So they've been drinking, they get into this sort of disagreement. There were some neighbors, and they call the cops. The cops showed up, one being Jimmy Fennell, Jr., and separated us so that they could figure out what was going on. The police end up arresting her boyfriend. According to police reports, Sergeant Fennell ends up telling one of the other officers that he was going to try and get intelligence from her. The only one that was still there was Fennell. We were alone. And that's when I was asking, you know, please take me to my boyfriend. So he took me over to the patrol car and he put me in the front seat. So we started driving. I started to realize that something was wrong when we pulled into a secluded park. And he came around to my side and told me to get out. And so I got out and he took out his weapon and he laid it in front of me. And then he slammed me up against the back of his patrol car. And then he jerked my pants down. <clears throat> and he raped me. And I didn't fight back because I was scared. And when he was done, he put me back in the patrol car, drove me back to the apartment complex, and he handed me a business card and told me that we were gonna do it again the next day. Connie ends up going to one of her neighbors and calls 911. Nine one one. What's the address for your emergency? Oh God! That is me. Okay. What what agency was the cop with? Was it Georgetown or? Where is Williamson County, Georgetown, Texas? I don't want to come back here. Okay. We're gonna send somebody out to help you. Okay? I I will drive me off. It's gonna be a different officer to come talk to you. I want an ambulance and a red kitten to stay on the phone with me I'm, and okay. say what? I'm on the phone with you. I'm not going to hang up, okay? Only a couple of minutes went by, and I noticed spotlights. I saw the patrol cars pulling in with no ambulance. And the closer they got, I realized that the first police officer in line was Jimmy Fennell. <laughs> According to what one of the other officers wrote in his report, Sergeant Fennell tells an officer she's claiming that I raped her. Connie says she was then placed in a police car and then forced to take back her claim that Fennell raped her. And I looked into the patrol camera and I said I made the whole incident up. And after I was done, he said, okay, well, you're under arrest for public intoxication. Put your hands behind your back. After Lear was taken to the Williamson County Jail, she called 911, and she got the attention of the Sheriff's Office and the Texas Rangers. A criminal investigation was opened that same day. Connie Lear was released from jail and taken to a hospital for treatment. The charge against her was dropped. A few days later, formal charges were filed against Jimmy Fennell. Jimmy Fennell Jr. now faces charges of sexual assault, kidnapping, improper sexual activity with a person in custody, and official oppression. You know, if he got convicted on 
all of those charges, Jimmy would face more than 99 years in prison. Instead, um, he pleaded guilty to one count of improper sexual relations with a person in custody and one count of kidnapping. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. I mean, the mug shots of Jimmy Finnell make him look like a monster, but up close and personal, just a likable country boy, in no way am I denying that he committed a crime because there was misconduct that he admitted and took responsibility for. The DA never talked to me about programming. That wasn't their choice to be made, that was mine. After Jimmy Finnell goes to prison, it's discovered that he was the subject of several internal affairs investigations that involved allegations of sexual assault and misconduct. According to police reports, he had this pattern of targeting certain women, and it seemed like he was really targeting women who were vulnerable, and he would use those as leverage to get them to do sexual acts with him. Jimmy Finnell's defense attorney, Robert Phillips, told ABC News that authorities apparently thought so little of these extraneous offenses that none of them were ever prosecuted, nor did these women ever testify in court. In Jimmy Finnell's case, he found the Lord after 10 years of hard time in a Texas prison, and he's trying to put the pieces together to create a new world for himself. Jimmy uh, was never going to be police officer of the decade. This is a person that is supposed to protect you. There's no 10-year sentence that frees me of the things that he did to me. While Jimmy Finnell has done his time and is out on a new path as a free man, Rodney Reed is still on death row. Rodney Reed's death sentence is not the end of the story. It's actually the start of a new chapter when attorneys from the Innocence Project step in to unearth a new witness. She told me that she was sleeping with a black guy, and I remember being completely shocked. She and I both, you know, proceeded to say, like, wow, you need to be careful with this. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Well, uh, I think it's pretty hard for an African-American man to be accused of raping and murdering a white woman in the state of Texas, be found guilty, and not receive the death penalty. We have an expression uh, among our colleagues in uh, you know, the innocence movement, it doesn't take a village, it takes an army. How could you not be affected by a person on death row that you think the evidence shows by clear and convincing uh, proof is innocent, right? What I spend my time doing is calling individuals who may have information from that time back in 1996 who are willing to come forward. It's an enormous challenge. We are in a position now where 24 years later we're having to go out and try to speak to people and ask them uh, about things they might have seen a quarter of a century ago. What I see when I am in Bastrop is a community that has progressed from that time back in 1996. I think the idea of an interracial relationship was something that was frowned upon in that community. I think that's changed. You might recall that the jury was not convinced that there was a relationship. This was a very damaging, even devastating part of his trial. Alicia Slater is a witness who worked at the HEB with Stacy, who has come forward talking about the relationship that existed between Rodney Reed and Stacy Stites. In 1995, Stacy and I worked together at HEB. She told me that she wasn't that excited to get married. 
because she was sleeping with a black guy named Rodney. To hear that she was actually having an affair was shocking to begin with. She and I both, you know, proceeded to say like, wow, you need to be careful with this. Being an 18 year old about ready to graduate high school, I didn't want to get involved. In a 2016 filing, the state contends that her account is patently unbelievable and that she failed to mention the secret affair when she spoke to police at the time of the murder. If Rodney Reed did have a relationship with Stacy Stites, doesn't that complicate your case? Well, sure. However, it's awfully hard to find this evidence credible that he's, he miraculously has this secret affair with this girl and somehow his semen hangs around for several days. Which science says it can do. There are exceptions. There are no absolutes in science. That's why you look at all of the extraneous evidence as well in conjunction with just the DNA. When you look at the actual police reports of the investigation, there was a lot of mistakes early on. Um, one of the key mistakes from the first day, it is Murder Investigation 101 that you go to where the last person saw that victim. Why wouldn't they search Jimmy's apartment? I wish law enforcement would have searched the apartment. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that, no, eh, they it was okay. I mean, but I will tell you this, um, I've been doing this a long time, and never once have I ever had a case where I didn't at some point say, gosh, I wish law enforcement would have done whatever it is, X. They were looking at Jimmy, but yet they turned his truck back over to him within a week after they had fully processed it. But if they're looking at him as a suspect, why would they turn his truck back over to him? Why wouldn't they? Forensically speaking, they did everything that was available to examine the truck forensically at the time. And so it, it wouldn't have made any sense for them to keep it. He needed wheels. One of the challenges that I've had specifically working on this case is getting witnesses to come forward. The problem has been they're fearful, but we have nine new witnesses in this most recent appeal. One of those witnesses is an insurance lady. She's trying to encourage Stacy Stites to purchase some uh, insurance on her life. And Stacy sort of laughs and says, gosh, I'm so young, I, I have no need for insurance. And this insurance lady provided an affidavit saying that at that moment, before she can say anything more, Jimmy Fennell then says, if you ever cheat on me, I will kill you and no one will ever know about it. One of the witnesses who has come forward is a gentleman named Charles Wayne Fletcher, the former member of the Bastrop County Sheriff's Office. In an affidavit, Fletcher recalls Jimmy Fennell saying, I believe she is sleeping with a black man. Keep in mind, the way that Mr. Fletcher tells the story, Jimmy Fennell does a racial slur and he didn't say the word sleeping. And every time a new person comes forward, it's more colorful and creative than the last. I keep waiting for Mother Teresa to be the next witness from beyond the grave. It's just nonsense. He's not guilty of murder, he didn't do it, and the evidence shows that. In its response, the state argues that neither witness is believable because they waited so long to come forward. What did the state completely get wrong as far as you're concerned about her death? Everything. They were like, oh my God, uh, this is way off. Rodney Reed has been on death row for more than 20 years. With just weeks to go before he was about to be executed, we traveled to Texas to hear his story. You're sitting here with me and the clock is ticking. Yes. You set to be executed. Bryce Benjet and this whole team of lawyers have been working on 
this case and struggling so hard for so many years. So one day I get a call from Detective Sergeant Gannon and he had been looking at this independently and he says, I found something new and you guys got to hear about it. This homicide detective pointed at what he thought was obvious. That was a big deal. Detective Gannon. So Detective How Sergeant Gannon. Nice to uh, see you. You're, you're former NYPD. Well, it's homicide, right? Yeah. The state's case essentially was that she was intercepted on her way to work, that she was raped, and that she was strangled. What did the state completely get wrong as far as you're concerned about her death? Everything. We're like, oh my God, this is way off. What was way off? Time of death was, was way off. It was, it was hours earlier. I give a lot of credit to Kevin Gannon because he did point to the key scientific evidence that really showed that they were all wrong. And then when we take this to the actual medical examiner who testified, he gives us a sworn statement that said, nobody should have relied on what I said. Here's what the medical examiner wrote. My estimate of time of death was only an estimate and should not have been used at trial as an accurate statement of when Miss Stites died. It's one of the great things about the system. In a way, you can go back to court, not as easily as it should be. If you can get the proof, you should be able to get an exoneration. Family and supporters of Rodney Reed gathered in the Bastrop County courtroom today. Rodney Reed's defense attorneys are trying to include forensic evidence from that 1996 murder that they say will prove his innocence. Michael Baden, B-A-V-E-N. Dr. Baden has weighed in on some of the biggest cases from O.J. Simpson to George Floyd. Reed's defense team brings him in to talk about the timing of Stacy's death using the science of lividity. The lividity is because of the settling of the red blood cells in down position. After about four, five, six hours, the lividity stays, and that's called fixed lividity. In this instance, there was fixed lividity in the front of her body. Not on her back, as her body was discovered. That means that Stacy Stites was dead in a different position four or more hours prior to the time of that 3 to 5 a.m. window in order to get that way. All that shows that this homicide occurred hours before 3 a.m. at a time that she was just with Jimmy. Now, he mentioned that there was other factors. Yes, there was another, which is called classic sign of death, rigor mortis which you, uh, stiffening of the body. After somebody is dies, it begins to set in where the body stiffens and contracts. And that process begins uh, and goes through a period of about 12 hours and then begins to slacken. We have videotape of the body of Stacy Stites being examined, manipulated, and put into a body bag. That video shows that she can be put into that body bag and her arms folded. The rigor mortis was present but leaving the body. So this would put it about 20 hours, something like that, uh, of death where the rigor has come, stayed, and then started going away. And that is very powerful scientific evidence that again, the time of death is way before that 3 a.m to 5 a.m. window of the prosecution's case. If she's killed at midnight and not 3 a.m., then Rodney Reed is excluded as the killer. So according to the defense's legal filings, the perpetrator then becomes Jimmy Finnell because he said he was in the apartment with her that night. No, not based on any of the credible evidence or physical evidence or forensic evidence. It's a concoction of creative, brilliant lawyers trying to save a condemned man. And the state argues that none of these methods establishing the time of death are totally reliable or have pinpoint accuracy. And Dr. Baden agrees. I agree with that, yes. That concludes the hearing. We go way of Rodney. Love you, baby. Yeah. The judge says the new evidence is not compelling enough for a retrial. 
The judge said he rejected Bodden's testimony because it would not necessarily have changed the opinion of the jury and that other evidence of Reed's guilt was strong. The court went on to say that Dr. Bodden never examined the body and that he based his opinion on crime scene reports, videos, and photos. In the meantime, another court has set an execution date for Rodney Reed. A state judge granted prosecutors' request to set Reed's execution for November 20th. At this point, there is outrage all over the country about this execution. The national media has gotten involved. And in the middle of this outcry, I travel to Texas and sit down with Reed on death row. You're sitting here with me and the clock is ticking. Yes. You set to be executed? I hope not, but yes. I am holding on, not just for myself, but for my family. The jury believed that you killed Stacy Stites. Did you rape Stacy Stites? No, I didn't. Did you kill Stacy no, Stites? No, I absolutely did not. How would you describe your relationship with her? Were you in love with her? I couldn't say that I was in love with her. We were both in relationships. I was seeing someone else. She was seeing someone else. So it was a casual, it was casual. sexual relationship? Yes, that's all. If I wouldn't have known her, if I wouldn't have been associated with her, I wouldn't be in this situation. But this is the situation that was handed to me. I have to accept that I'm here now for something that I didn't do. Earlier this week, attorneys for Reed sent a new letter to the governor to ask for a delay in the execution. What's on the line is pretty much everything. We had unprecedented support from really all over the world. Kim Kardashian West asked Rodney, is there anything that I can do to be helpful to this case? No. Something's off here. Something needs to be done. Free Rodney Reed! Free Rodney Reed! Free Rodney Reed! Free Rodney Reed! No! Free Rodney Reed! Free Rodney Reed! They've held dozens of rallies and protests. We had unprecedented support. I don't know if it's social media coverage or media coverage, but just the closer we got, the louder the noise. A rally outside the Texas governor's mansion. Yeah. Something's off here, something needs to be done. Breaking news this afternoon, Rodney Reed will not be executed next week. An indefinite stay of execution. A victory for death row inmate Rodney Reed in the fight to clear his name. The hearing coming up keeps on getting postponed because of COVID-19. The one thing I'm very confident about is that the more you look at it and the more you look at the forensic pathology and the science, it's clear and convincing evidence of innocence. Do I think Rodney Reed killed Stacey Stites? Yes. I do think that in our criminal justice system is not a perfect system, and that's one reason why I'm not a, a, a proponent of the death penalty. There is room for error. I have no doubt about his guilt. I have tried and tried to figure out somehow that Rodney Reed didn't kill Stacey Stites. I can't get there. And I've also tried to figure out how Jimmy, her fiance, could have done it, and I also can't get there. I have a son, a son's life to save. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm going to do until I, until I leave. I have to hold on to my faith and stand on this truth and the facts and thank the world. I thank the world for the support. I have so much support. And God knows I thank the whole, the whole world. But leave me alone with my pain. And what do you say to people who say that this case may be a miscarriage of justice? I find that people have not heard all of the evidence. What upsets you most? <laughs> Trying to defend my sister. And the, the lies told her about her. While Carol's daughter was a teen mom, she made a tough decision to give up her baby girl for adoption. Stacy Stice's child is now a 26-year-old mom of two. My oldest is Stacy Lee. She's named after Stacy. I wanted her legacy to live on. She has grandchildren that she never will get to meet. The only reason I'm doing this right now is I 
think we really have a shot of getting this across that Stacy was human and all she wanted to do is get married and have a baby.